Today, a lovely spring day, you know. Um, we're busy drilling spring corn at the time in one of the fields. 3 and 3.30 is the busy time of the day. London's still trading. Coming up towards the close, America's open half an hour beforehand. And funnily enough, I managed to find about 20 people who also wanted to have lunch on the same day. And uh, we had sort of took one of those private, private rooms upstairs. And they were actually having, actually having bedrooms put into Groucho's at the time. So there's a lot of building work had been going on, some huge scaffolding. I was extremely anxious. I had very severe misgivings for his safety. I had the television set up on the desk. And just about when the start was about to raise his flag, the bell went in reception. I thought, oh, no. So I walked down to the reception, there's a chap there, I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, yes, he said, my father's passed away and I'd like to make the funeral arrangements. So I said to the chap, you know, if you'd like to just take a seat, I'll be with you in 10 minutes. And he must have heard the television because he said, is that the Chilton Gold Cup on your television? I had to get away, I couldn't watch the race. So I got the dog and got as far away from media coverage as I could. I took my radio to school that day, hid it in my bag, in the hope that I'll be able to use it and hear the Gold Cup later in the afternoon. Right up until we went home, uh, we were taking bets on anything we could find, tops of sporting lives. While I've got these clothes on, he's coming home safe at the end of every race and that's all that matters to me. I mean, I haven't told that many what I actually do, but the two or three that have actually found out, they, they do, they think I'm stone raving mad. Cheltenham had never been his favourite course in the past and three and a quarter miles, we were pretty convinced it would be soft ground. We didn't see anything in his favour. I just said to my teacher, um, can I go a bit early, please, because I've got an optician's appointment. And tell him when I had an optician's appointment. We're very interested in prices here. We're watching gold and watching Desert Orchid moving out to seven to two. I ran onto the, the footbridge, which was on my way home, over the dual carriageway. We were trying to keep the customers in contact with what was happening and then it turned out fewer and fewer of them were answering the phone. Uh, and um, by the time, the time the race started, nobody was answering the phone and it seemed the city of Grand Hall. The place just stopped completely. I mean, there's 20 of us sitting there watching the television and this kind of growing, mounting excitement. It's quite fantastic. And uh, as, as he came down the hill and turned into the straight, like now everyone's on their feet. I mean, like everyone you've been sitting down with your brandy in your hand, you put that down, you get up, now you've got 20 people standing in a room. I had my fingers tightly crossed and I was willing him over each jump. I was saying, come on, Dizzy, ping over that one. Well done, Dizzy. Please, please let him be all right. Please let him be all right. The Carville's Hill had gone early, the Thinker had gone, Ballyhane had gone. And we knew at halfway that we, there was no way the firm could win on the race. And it just become quieter and quieter. Come on, baby! Come on, baby! Come on, come on. Impressed by Desert Orchid. When the horse crossed the line, it was complete silence. We both finished up standing at the end of the desk, watching the television, embracing each other, hugging each other, punching the air, which is a very unfamiliar sight in the funeral directors. He actually, actually, actually thought that the thing had collapsed upstairs. He really, I mean, he was terrified. He came and expected to find us lying in amongst the rubble. And in fact, we were all standing there going, yeah! The chap sort of must have seen my embarrassment. He said, look, he said, my father was one of Desert Orchid's greatest fans, and he would have hated for anybody to have missed seeing Desert Orchid in his moment of glory because of his death. When I mean, you're drilling, Carl, like, you like to try and keep it in straight lines. I thought, I can't stand this anxiety any longer. I rang home. We'd only been in business 10 more days, we were losing £50,000. He realised that the, the building hadn't collapsed, in actual fact, just Desert Orchid on the World Cup.
In the desperate last strides of the Cheltenham Gold Cup and the chaotic scenes that followed, Desert Orchid became a racing legend. But the Gold Cup was the hardest race of his long career. Three weeks later, he ran at Liverpool and fell, the first time he'd ever fallen over fences. He was ready for a holiday. From May to July, he spends his days and his nights in a field. No longer a superstar, but just a horse getting fat in a field with his two-year-old sister. But as the summer wore on, we wondered how long the fairy tale could continue. My father Jimmy raised Desi from a foal and bought his grandmother, Grey Orchid, for 175 pounds. And not far from the field where Desi spends his summer is the place where it all started. 25 years ago, all these stables here were full of grey horses. I had a wild grey pony used to live in there. It was a grey hunter here. And in this stall was Grey Orchid, who of course was Desert Orchid's grandmother. 25 years ago, and all the grey horses we used to ride are long dead. My father Jimmy used to have to climb on Grey Orchid by the muck heap because she was so wild she used to rear over backwards. When we were growing up, horses were our whole lives and the place used to ring with our shouts and the crash of hooves on stone. But all that's left now are a few grey hairs on a bit and two donkeys. Yeah, after all that, two donkeys. And this one, exactly the same age as Flower Child, the mother of Desi. She was brought as a, a baby when we wanted to wean grey orchids. This was brought in as a baby to go with her. Flower Child was brought up here, and at the age of 12, she gave birth to Desert Orchid. Jimmy's looked after Des ever since during the summer and drives over regularly to check up on him. Desi's feet are a problem. He's had corns every April for the last five years. But you sometimes get the impression Jimmy makes a trip over to calm his own nerves. Well, I think looking after horses is probably the least rewarding of all occupations because the, the very, very highest you can get is things being normal. And the biggest and best thing that can happen is that nothing has happened. It's not like winning a race. You don't get the highs. The highs are just going out and seeing nothing is wrong. Curious how, how after about a month here, I couldn't be doing this a month ago. A month ago, he'd be prancing up a bit. But, but now, uh, he, he's like an old donkey, and he's OK. He's now eating my trousers, which he's not allowed to do normally. But, 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 he, but he's got the hang of that. But he doesn't mind my trousers. Do you quite enjoy coming to see him? Uh, yeah, I, I love seeing him. But I, I love seeing him gradually relax as the days go by. By this time of the year, he's like an, any other horse. He's completely relaxed. I never relax because um, every time I see him, I think that, that he's probably lost a leg or a tail or a head or something. It's one of the differences between jumpers and flat horses, that jumpers have long summer holidays away from the pressures of training to let the scars of battle heal. And though we don't get any postcards from him, he probably appreciates his holidays as much as any of us. And it's Desert Orchid. Desert Orchid and Pegwell Bay. And Desert Orchid takes it. Desert Orchid from Pegwell Bay on the far side. Kill Dymo back in turn. But Pegwell Bay is sticking to his guns. Will the Orchid bloom? It's Desert Orchid finishing fast. And Desert Orchid blooms. Desert Orchid wins. Desert Orchid wins. Also working hard like he's worked. He's got to have somewhere to unwind and this is a place to do it. You won't get a more ideal place than this. He's mostly asleep till about nine o'clock anyway. He's a great sleeper. Loves it. He seems to uh, relax in this field. Don't you? Omega. I think he knows where he is. He's very, very settled when he's here. Wouldn't be in a more ideal place because he's got great big edges all the way around and whichever way the wind blows, he's very sheltered and, uh, you know, he's, he can get out of the wind and the cold if it rains and if it's sunshine and lays in the middle of the field, enjoy yourself. Des has been coming back to this field all through his career. And though he was a brilliant hurdler, he only really hit the headlines when he won his first King George VI chase at 16 to 1, 
nobody but his trainer thought he'd stay three miles. It's Desert Orchid over safely. Cromford Gibbons against the top chaser in the country, held in second place. Dorlatch is third, Bernard's crossed four. Coombs this is being pulled up, but it's his stable companion, Desert Orchid, who's clear as they come down towards the 19th and final fence in this King George VI to rank steeplechase. At the last, Desert Orchid jumps it well. Desert Orchid clear from Forgive and Forget and Dorlatch as they race up towards the line. It's Desert Orchid for an amazing pillar to post win in this top class chase. Desert Orchid comes home well clear. And at the post, Desert Orchid is the winner. Desert Orchid well clear. It is extraordinary how many people and horses have contributed to the making of this one horse and how many people's lives are in turn affected by him as he stands mooching about in a field. And somewhere in a corner of Britain or Ireland, there's probably another horse grazing away who's going to take his crown one day. But for the time being, Desi is preoccupied solely with the search for peppermints, which he knows accompany visitors to his field. As May turns to June and June to July, Desert Orchid stays out day and night, rain and shine, just a horse at peace with the world. I stop by and see him from time to time, usually in a rush to get somewhere else, and envy him. Desi's holiday is over. The lazy days of summer have gone, and it's time for him to go back to Jimmy's house in Leicestershire to start his road work, and to get cleaned up to meet his fans. There was something about the way he won over all distances and on all kinds of ground last season that touched something quite deep in people. And after Cheltenham, my stepmother Midge started his fan club. <laughs> Not many horses could walk straight out of a field into a social function, but Des takes it all in his stride and seems to revel in all the attention. Des readily accepts his star status and loves having his picture taken. The click of a camera shutter is music to his ears, and there was even the suggestion he was in so many close finishes last season because he enjoyed having his picture taken by the photo finish camera. There's a rumour going around that um, you've uh, come from Penrith, is that right? Yeah. By, and how did you get here? In taxi. By taxi? Yeah. Mm. Who, who drove his taxi? No, I did. <laughs> Just as well, I'm interested in racing horses. <laughs> Has it been worth it? Nice yes. day out, very, very nice, yes. Yeah, been well, worthwhile. You <laughs> must be a bit of a disappointment to come all this way, just find a horse. No, no, it isn't. It's brilliant. Well worth coming. They're a special horse, a real athlete, I think. It's just any horse. It's nice to see those films again of the two races this year. Well, horses, to me, and my wife, is what life's all about. Especially a horse like Desert Orchid. I mean, he's, a, he's the best since Arkle. <laughs> and uh, that says everything, I think. It's just fantastic. Do you recognise him here from on the race oh, course? very much so. We recognise him anywhere, you know, the, the head and the, the eye. What's the thing you like about him most? The courage, I think. The courage of the horse. Outstanding. Outstanding. The serious business of getting him back onto the race course starts here. Jimmy changes his diet from grass to corn, gets him shod and starts his road work. While he's here, he completely dominates his life. And as with all of us, it's a question of whether we own Des or whether Des owns us. It has completely altered my life. Having bred a 
horse at this stature. And although I don't enjoy racing particularly, I, it has become a part of my life, and I can't conceive myself having any other sort of life now. He, he, has, he has changed it. I'm not saying he's changed it necessarily by adding to, to, to the enjoyment, but, he, but the fact that he's changed my life is, is, is unquestionable. When I first met Jimmy, and he said he owned two racehorses, in fact, they were two not particularly good point-to-pointers, I was so excited to have actually met someone who owned two racehorses. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that one had never won a point to point and the other had only won two is irrelevant. Hello. <laughs> you haven't seen one of these no, before? I no, I have I've always been against horse walkers as a matter of principle. But this, these open ones, I'm really very impressed they look, by. They look safe. Yeah. Before Des goes out on the roads, he has a daily spell on the horse walker to build up his leg muscles without any weight on his back. When a horse is fat and his muscles undeveloped, there's always a danger of damaging his tendons. However, Des is a reluctant participant in this ritual and obviously regards the whole thing as highly undignified. In the past, he's been far more successful racing on right-handed race courses than left-handed ones. And Jimmy takes care to make sure he spends equal time going clockwise and anti-clockwise. To be honest, Jimmy enjoys this part of his preparation more than he actually enjoys the racing. The only time I enjoyed watching racing, rarely, was when uh, Flowerchild raced. She was a very, very safe jumper. One drank a couple of bottles of champagne when she came in fourth. And, and, and it was all great fun when I said that I was going to breed from her to the local person who, who knew most of all about breeding. He said that if I was interested in breeding, the best thing I could do about Flowerchild was to shoot her and start again. So that wasn't very encouraging, but, but I was sufficiently fond of the horse to disregard that particular bit of advice. I asked PJ Swarbrick, who rides him here, what she thought of him this year. I think this year he feels a lot sharper in himself. Um, but um, no, he seems to have settled down now. I think um, Jimmy always had this feeling that anything he bred would be amazing. But I, I never since had that confidence. We'd had so many bad horses, I couldn't actually believe we'd have a good one. I thought he, he, he might make almost a sort of above average handicap of one day. That was the, the absolute height of my ambition, so far as he was concerned. I, I wanted him to win a race. I was terribly put off by Desi's first appearance, and I swore that I'd never be involved in a race horse case when I thought he died at Campton. Um, and then when Ragged Robin eventually did die at Worcester, I was also very, very shattered by it. So I, I must say that I never go to a race meeting over drums without a great deal of worry on that score. When I actually had bred a horse which won the King George the Thick, I thought I was God. What about the Gold Cup? The Gold Cup, I was too shattered, too much of a wreck to, 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 to take in at all. Desi used to do his six weeks road work on the narrow lanes round Jimmy's house. But lately things have started to become a little crowded round here. So it was time to take him up to the North Yorkshire Moors. One of the strange things about owning uh, such a famous horse is that the more and more famous he becomes, um, in a way, the more he gets taken away from you. There is, there is less of that feeling of sharing a kind of private moment with him, if you like. And it becomes quite complicated to hold on to the feeling that you've actually got anything to do with him because so many people know him and there's such a centre of so much publicity that Really, um, having him here is the only time of year that I can sort of feel in any real sense that he's mine. Hold that. Yep. Des likes to do his bit around the stable, though it's not always quite clear exactly what he thinks he's doing. But he's nearly 11 now, and he's clearly getting increasingly cranky in his old age, and insists on chewing anything he can get his teeth on, and basically of having things exactly as he likes them. 
amongst which is making his own bed. This daily and rather laborious ritual consists of him raking out his bale of shavings till he's made a really good mess of it, and only then having a long roll, which he obviously considers is an essential preliminary to any work he might be required to do later. We start with a three or four mile ride, and we work up to about nine or ten miles. Des tackles it all with his usual enthusiasm, but it's mostly walking, and we build him up gradually so there's no strain. Basically, having him here is an excuse for me to enjoy myself. But the roads around here are ideal. They're steep, so the horses quickly build up muscle. There's very little traffic, and it's so pretty we never get bored just walking. I resist the temptation to ride him myself because I'm supposed to be too heavy. But the mixture of the dales and the heather and just walking across a track, right across the middle of the moors with four thoroughbreds, one of whom just happens to be Desert Orchid, is pretty special. In the height of an English summer, the Gold Cup seems a long way away. It's been a marvelous summer. It's an old-fashioned summer. This is what they used to be like, though, when we were kids. All summers were like this, you know. You could guarantee. You could guarantee. Ah, oh, good. Though I've got four other horses here, there's only one star, and everyone who comes to help me out is affected by him. You do tend to sort of set up your own sort of privileged time with him, although there's a lot of people surrounding him and a lot of people lay claim to him. You can still... Um, engineer this moment for yourself and and Des is always kind enough to give you that. <laughs> Sometimes he'll, he'll root himself and then um, there's only one particular horse that he likes to uh, uh, have a lead from. But uh, his sisters, he doesn't like his sisters overtaking him at all and he gets very cross if they come up behind him and he certainly lets them know. Everyone says, what's it like riding Desert Orchid? You tell them. Great. <laughs> it's like getting on a mountain sitting on Des after two year olds. Now and then he kicks and backs a bit. Why do you think he does that? Happy. High spirits showing as well. Do you think he'd be as good this year as he was last year? There's life in the old dog yet. After lunch, Des gets a stream of visitors, whom to his surprise seem completely obsessed by him. I followed pretty well every race he's been in. I've watched him. Every race I could, I've, I've watched him. I've s suffered agonies in case he didn't win. And for nine times, you didn't let me down, did you? You won all your races for nine times in a row. Yes, you did. I think you're the most, m most marvelous horse. Can you, believe, can you believe this is him? I can't. I, can, I, I never thought I was ever going to see him, let alone be in close contact with him. I think he's I, just eaten your button. I think he has. <laughs> I don't care what he does. <laughs> he can pull. <laughs> Would you say this horse plays a, a big part in your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. He really does. I mean... Oh. <laughs> you are a wicked boy. <laughs> oh, look what you're doing. You're eating my cardigan. Yes. I've never been so thrilled about anything. I never thought it was so wonderful to have a cardigan e eaten up. <laughs> Increasingly, having Des here becomes like hosting a continuous party. And I haven't put turnstiles on this place yet. But as the word gets out, he is here. The piece of a quiet corner of Yorkshire gets well and truly shattered. He's a kind of magnet. He draws people to him. And there's a never-ending flow of people coming to see him. I walk out of my house sometimes to find 12 cars in the car park. People come up with some very odd excuses, but they only really want to come and see him. Some people pretend they want to come and see me, but I could see through that one last year, because the minute Des left, I didn't get a single visitor for two and a half months. So I think that made it pretty clear what the main attraction is around here. In late August, we were hit by a local outbreak of equine flu, and Des coughed for a few days. And though he was never sick, we waited for him to recover. Then on David Ellsworth's advice, got Edmund Collins, the local vet, to come and give him a booster injection. Then before Des went back, I asked George Armitage to come and check out his back. As a horse jumping over a hundred fences every season at high speed, carrying 12 stone, is bound to have the occasional problem. But happily, everything was all right this time. 
Is he all right? It's quite all right. So he was all set to go back to David Ellsworth when David rang to say that his yard had gone down with a cough. Because he can't stay here, I'm not going to be here next week. So I'm going to have to do something with him. Jeannie Brown was taking the rest of my horses here, so I asked whether she'd take Des for a few weeks as well. Desi would not get any special treatment if he came into our yard. He'd get treated like the others do. He gets smacked if he was No, well, not no. just slightly. <laughs> slightly smacked. <laughs> I would think so. Well, no wonder he's turned his back <laughs> on you. No, I wouldn't smack him, but uh, I mean, you can't let them get away with murder, can you? It looked like Des would be staying in Yorkshire a few weeks longer. Then David rang again. Hello? Hello, David. Yeah. He decided to put uh, him in an isolation you? yard near him in Hampshire yeah. so he could keep an eye on him and move him back into training as soon as the cough cleared. He would be coming up in two days' time. The summer was over, the heather was turning brown, and Desi was about to head south again to start his training all over again. I always feel a mixture of emotions at this time of year. Happy that we've been able to look after him and give him a good holiday without too many disasters, but sad that he'll be leaving. The other horses will be leaving too, and it will all seem very quiet here without them. It's a time to start thinking about next season too. Whether we'll run him in the Gold Cup, whether he'll be as good as ever, whether he can live up to his own reputation. Everybody seemed to think he'd be even better, but you could never tell. We were about to find out. <laughs> well, look, have a look. Well, well, I just wondered, can you pull up? Will you pull I mean, up we, there? I mean, you could drive it. up there a bit, couldn't you? No, that's because his yard was closed, David Ellsworth came up himself this year to take delivery of Des and brought with him a large Volvo horse box, horse box driver Martin Jenkins, and Janice Coyle, who looks after Des at David's yard. Janice has herself become something of a celebrity in the process of looking after Des. Far out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Far out. It's nice. Far away from everything, yeah. It's beautiful up here, isn't it? Mm. Never windy, never cold. <laughs> Come and see the great man. Hello. Oh, <laughs> God, it's her. <laughs> Hello. Remember me? What do you think? Do you think he looks any better? Fantastic. He looks great, huh? Oh, Hello. So is that, is that the stuff? No, not at all. Hello. Oh, special, I see. Yeah. No, he looks great, doesn't he? Looks fantastic. I'm pleased to see you. Did you last saw him? Yeah, he's, he's all okay, you know. Hi. Hi. Can we give him a job? Great. Well done. Well and these are all stopped, <laughs> Richard. These have all stopped coughing. Yep, they've all stopped. I think he's definitely had it. This is the thing he'll do whenever he doesn't want to do anything. He'll delay it by having a roll. He doesn't want to go. He eventually rolled, but the summer seemed well and truly over as a thick fog descended as I led him down my drive. I could feel the power in him, and he needed more work than we could give him. But to be honest, I have come to enjoy having him up here as much as his racing, perhaps even more so. For a few moments, I would gladly have retired him there and then. We had done everything we could, and the strange burden of looking after this living legend now passed to David and his staff. David has had Des since he was a three-year-old and knows him inside out, but even he had a little difficulty in getting him into the horse box. Come on, no muck about Des. Turn him round. Turn him round. Perhaps I was imagining it, but Des seemed reluctant to go. You couldn't help wondering what lay ahead. Had the Gold Cup taken its toll, would he still be as enthusiastic as ever? <laughs> yeah, he's running down there. <laughs> 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 
The fog rolled in as Dez disappeared down the drive for the seven-hour drive to Hampshire. And that was the last I was to see of Desert Orchid for several weeks. But not to hear of him. In the summer, a small industry had grown up round him, but in fact Desert Orchid had been public property for some time. He's also always been surrounded by people in the paddock and winner's enclosure, and I'm sure at times other people have wondered who they all were. Initially, I didn't um, tell very many people at all that I had a, a, an interest in Des. In fact, I didn't even tell my, tell, uh, my wife for, for, for about nine months uh, afterwards. And she was horrified. I mean, it used to be my proud boast that I could get Desert Orchid into any conversation within 40 seconds. And now I've found that 40 seconds isn't fast enough to beat the person I'm talking to. You can get credit anywhere saying, you're, 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 my son owns Desert Orchid. I, I, I do absolute miracles in shops nowadays. Do you get credit anywhere doing that? Yes, definitely. I mean, the fish man came last week. I'd never met him before. And he, I said, I'm sorry I haven't any money today. Um, and he said, oh, it's all right. If you, you, your son owns Desert Orchid. You can leave it till next week. Well, there I'm, I'm uh, certainly the least well known of the owners. Uh, I don't think a day ever goes by when I don't get involved in a conversation with our Des. Although I must say that I have to take some credit for starting those conversations myself on occasion. I have the special Desi hat with the ostrich feather, partly because because uh, I try I tried always to wear blue and grey, and it sort of got, got a bit astray sometimes with these racing colours. But also, all my friends can spot me on the television when they see my feather. We win or lose, this is the hat. On the inside of Run and Skip, normally a front runner. But Desert Orchid, uh, here's Prick, comes to take the ditch, jumps it superbly. They're all over the second, and it's Desert Orchid in the lead. Hasn't got as uh, near as warm today as he has in the past, this grey out in front where he likes to be. I have four sons, and he's like a fifth son, really. And I worry about him terribly. And he, when we go to see him setting off, it's just as if I was seeing any of you off an aeroplane or something. I worry terribly until I know he's safely back again. As soon as the race starts, I, I can't watch anymore. I just shut my eyes and pray and, and listen to the commentator. And, and my favourite commentators are always the ones who say, safely, all over safely, safely over that one. ...to take the third from home, and it's Desert Orchid who leads there. From in second place, run and skip. Strands of gold looks a big danger. That one's going through into third. Kill Dymo, the top wave for the yellow sleeves on the right of the four as they come down towards the second last. And the crowd warm for this now. And it's Desert Orchid in the lead from Kill Dymo on the right. Strands of gold in between them. And Kill Dymo is travelling strongly. They come down towards the 24th and final fits. The grey on the left, Desert Orchid. On the right is Kill Dymo. And at the last, Desert Orchid and Kill Dymo jumping together. We've got a race on here. Desert Orchid in the lead from Kill Dymo and Kip. Desert Orchid goes on. Desert Orchid goes on by The race is being raised here at Sandown as Desert Orchid wins the whip red. Desert Orchid, Kill Dymo, Strands of Gold, the one, two, three. I've known a horse that loves his racing so much. And he, you know, he, he doesn't owe us anything, but equally, he'd never forgive us if he retired him too early. And, uh, and certainly this year, I think he'll be as good as ever. As soon as he came out of the horse box, he said, oh, God, I'm at that place again. <laughs> Daddy, now you should be trotting. He's probably the easiest horse in the yard to train and look after because he's... Uh, he's been a, a exceptionally enthusiastic, hard-working, all the sort of things, all the virtues you look for in people. And as he's got them all, he tries very hard. Great competitor. King George is the race for him in the first half of the season. And um, we'd like to win a race or two on the way, but that's what we're geared to. He has such a high standard. Uh, I would um, feel very badly, so would everybody, I'm sure, if we ever produced him and then realised, and these things are usually realised afterwards, that perhaps you, you hadn't got him right. Or sometimes you've got fears and they're ungrounded, and other times you've got fears and, and, and in fact, they materialise. And, and that's, uh, that's our biggest worry, our biggest anxiety is, is not fulfilling our part. The acid test will come when we start taking on the best opposition in the height of the season. Then. It's the 10% um, of uh, effort which is required, and 
in the, in the business end of a race, which will tell you whether he's, he's as good as he was last year. Each year he gets older and there are new, younger stars coming on. And um, whether it be this year or next year, or the year after, I mean, it'll happen. Some will, will um, prove to be superior. There's a lot of hard work looking after racehorses, and life starts very early in the morning at Whitsbury. Desi's success is entirely down to the dedication and expertise of David and his staff. And in spite of all the triumphs of last season, everyone remains realistic, none more so than David himself. We don't want to have it all clear cut that Desert Orc is going to sail through all his races. I sincerely hope he does, but having said that, it'd be a bit boring if we all knew that, and we're all hoping he will, but there'll be a lot of pretenders, and some of them mightn't be pretending too much, you'll come along and beat him. Rodney Bolt has ridden him for six years, and in the process turned Des from a tearaway into a professional racehorse. But Rodney isn't allowed to go racing, because every time he's been to the racecourse, Des has been beaten. I'm not going to go and watch Desi run again because I haven't brought in any luck, have I? You don't get a sneak in to watch him race no, again. I you, didn't last year, did I? <laughs> you don't know. Where did you were Liverpool. <laughs> Where you were Liverpool. Oh, he yeah. comes from Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. You weren't Liverpool then, Rodney? No. You didn't sneak home for the weekend, did you? Coincidentally, Des stays in the same yard where his sire, the Myler Grey Mirage, used to be in training. He is 10 years old. I should think he's probably at the point of equilibrium, or he may be just the other side and going down. I mean, he'll obviously, um, whatever athlete, or whatever sport you do, you peak at some time. And he was so wonderful last year that one has to think probably that was his, you know, that was his best. Captain Ryan Price often said, any fool can get to the top. Uh, it's very difficult to stay there, uh, and that applies to most sports. You can be suddenly be the, regarded as the best or the champion or whatever you are at the moment, and then somebody's always there ready to knock you off your perch. David's genius is keeping horses fresh and happy in their work, and his blend of discipline and understanding has improved Des yeah. every year without ever spoiling him. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine what life would be like when he retires? Um... It'll be all an anticlimax, really, I think. Do you think he's got any, any intention of retiring? Well, he'll have to retire one day. Can't go on forever. Do you think it's occurred to him yet? It's occurred to lots of other people. He's done so much and he's done so well that anything else is a bonus to us now. And if he does go on and win more races, then, you know, we're very fortunate. Someone who has already decided to call it a day is Simon Sherwood, his former jockey. I'd always been thinking about changing uh, to becoming a trainer for the last sort of couple of seasons, really. And it was just a question of finding a, a place. Come sort of um, Cheltenham time, I'd sort of subconsciously accepted the fact that I would retire. He has something a little bit special, you know, something which is more difficult to give up than most horses. And it's that sort of extra um, charisma that he possesses that makes that all more difficult to give him up. But then uh, one has to come to terms with that sort of fact. And as long, you know, I'll be very busy doing this winter with this and various other things that hopefully will keep me busy enough to, uh, so I won't be sort of thinking about it all the time. I had sort of six fantastic years riding him. Um, and I feel I'm still very much involved. I mean, I see and speak to you a lot and David and uh, everybody involved with him and Simon up until he retired just recently. Uh, no, we're all very much involved. It's a great part of my life. I've had this pub two years, and uh, everybody knows the Orchid Bar now. They're always going to look at the pictures, and you know, I spend half an hour or so, can't get away from them, and I don't get a word in edgeways. And from what people tell me of the great horses over the years, you know, the likes of Arkles and Red Rums, I mean, I'm not in a position to compare them, and I wouldn't like to, but uh, he certainly has touched most people's hearts. He's given me much more confidence as an individual um, because you, I suppose you, in ways you gain a side of identity through him all, all of a sudden. Um, but he has, um, you know, he's basically given me all the fun that I've had in racing. Um, it's 99 of it is, is down to him in the last sort of year or so. Um, and that Gold Cup day is something that I'll never ever forget. 
David was at Newmarket winning the Cheveley Park stakes with dead certain, but the dry summer was giving him problems as the hard ground made it difficult to work the jumpers. Even the famous Whitsbury turf was becoming bone hard. The ground's been firm the majority of the summer. I'm just praying for rain at the moment. Have you been able to work them much yet? Not as much as we have done in previous years. Um, it's just another uh, river to cross, you know. Um, it just limits what you can do. A bit worrying. Yeah, very. But with his first gallop, you again recognize the racehorse, the champion over two to three and three quarter miles on ground from firm to heavy, a perfectly balanced racing machine. Desert Orchid has one, one school over fences just to get his eye in, just to give him a practice. So I'll see if I can get Richard down to have a sit on him and jump a fence with him before he runs. You can guarantee Desi will not be looking this relaxed when he first sees a fence. And Richard Dunwoody, his new jockey, was the lucky man who'd landed the job of schooling him. Were his previous jockeys going to give him any advice? Yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to let him know anything? Or what are you going to do? Well, I'm certainly not going to give him any advice. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think um, I will. <laughs> I, I seem to remember we beat Charter Party, which he was riding all last season anyhow. And so hopefully he's experienced a bit just by watching us from behind. Richard Dunwoody had won a Grand National on West Tip and a Gold Cup on Charter Party. So he was hardly a stranger to the big occasion. But those days of high drama would seem to pale into insignificance compared with the hair-raising annual event of Desi's first practice over fences. But what was it like the first time you saw a fence? Very uh, exciting, actually. Um, even David's son Simon got up that morning to come and watch. You know, if there's something dangerous going on, everybody's up there wanting to watch. <laughs> and uh, Des was quite revved up by that time because it was the end of his... Uh, end of the season, he'd just fallen over hurdles at Ascot, and uh, we thought we'd give him one pop before the next season that he was going novice chasing. And as I said, he went up over those fences. I think it took 12 seconds to jump four, and then big circle at the top trying to pull him up. <laughs> I think I walked him home. Simon's only school on Des was equally unorthodox. David said to me, there'll be a horse galloping on a flat alongside you, and I'll actually jumping the fences. I thought, this is a slightly novel sort of form of schooling. And, uh, I thought, you know, every trainer has their quirks, and David obviously has more quirks than most. So off I set, and by the time I jumped the fifth fence, this horse which was galloping on a flat alongside, which was actually a flat horse, um, I think I was about 20, 20, 30 yards in front of him. So sort I of pulled up to let the other one come and pick me up. Um, that and was that was it. a brand time. That was Indian Ridge you were schooling with. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> and the one which one in Ascot, that one. Yeah. Every time Dez sees a fence, it's like an explosion has gone off in his head. as we went round down past, past the hurdles and showed him the fence. But, uh, we've, we've gone up there, he nearly jumped the path of the, yeah, the all-weather at the end. But it's, it's all power, you know. It's uh, given, given me a great feel. Well, you followed him a few times and you've beaten him a few times, so what's it like to actually sit on top of him? Is it no, any it's, different? No, it's, well, he's given me a lovely feel and, you know, it's, uh, no, it's smashing to be on him. There's always an element of risk, and uh, one wants to avoid any risk if possible. But there you are, one's got to school. How's it go? It, it, very well. Good, good television stuff. He he stood off outside the wings a couple of times. He's very fresh and well, you know. And uh, this is why we schooled him just to get his mind right. A lot of pressure on the jock first time riding Des. How do you think Richard Dunwoody copes with it all? Uh, I thought he coped very well. He didn't look too nervous afterwards. He got on very well. The rain had come at last, and the stage was now set for Desi's first race of the season. I, for one, won't be too disappointed if he gets beaten. Um, at least I'll, I, 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 won't, I won't enjoy it, obviously, but one's got to accept these things. Um, where I, I don't want to see him get beaten uh, is at Kempton on Boxing Day. Entries, please. A0725, Mr Hill, Mr Ellsworth. Which race do you think he's going to go for at the moment? Well, probably win Canton uh, in a three-mile limited handicap. Race number 21211. 
desert orchid. I've seen the four days at this at this particular instant in time. Uh, he's giving a stone and a half to horses like Roller Joint, who won the Scottish National, and Golden Freeze, who are in their own right are very good good horses. And um, uh, it's going to be a tall order. There was even more pressure this year because my woolen racing colours had shrunk at Cheltenham, and we'd had to get a new set made. This is the kind of thing everybody hates because it can be notoriously unlucky to change colours. And as his first race approaches, we all cling helplessly to our superstitions and rituals. The race was a handicap and Des was going to have to concede a stone and a half to all the other horses. But as soon as he was a definite runner, all except one horse pulled out. As the crowds headed towards Wincanton for Desi's first race, his last two races were on all our minds. His last race was back in April when he'd fallen at Liverpool and seemed a tired horse. And the race before that was the Cheltenham Gold Cup. It was an incredibly hard race and has totally exhausted horses before now. We knew that when we ran him and that was the risk we took, but today was the acid test. Did he still have his appetite for racing? Was he as good as ever? Had that race taken something irreplaceable out of him? The jury was still out. Desi was going to be a hot favourite, and though it was only a two-horse race, Desi's opponent, Roller Joint, won six races last year, and Des had to concede him 23 pounds. But the stakes were higher than that. As the seconds tick by and the race itself approaches, it is not defeat that frightens you. You won't go racing very often if you can't take defeat. No, it is not too much to say that every time Des goes out onto a race course, he risks his life. All of us are aware of that every time we go racing. He is very precious to us all, and invariably we wonder why we risk him. And before the tapes go up, we all pray for only one thing, that he comes back safely. But as you pray, you realize how blessed you are and that you must always be as brave as the horse himself. Because one thing is sure, superstar or living legend or plain show off, this horse was born to race.
three or four lanes clear. He jumped it confidently and roller joint in second position. And it's Desert Orchid who draws to it, pops over it nicely, three or four lanes clear of the third fence now. Another plane one, Desert Orchid measures it well, comes to it and took off a little bit early but landed about uh, four lengths in front of Roller Joint as they swing right-handed now and head towards the water for the first time. No questions asked yet as they come towards the second of the ditches. As they leave the back behind them and head towards the home straight their way around the home turn and uh, they've still got one over a circuit to go. Three plane fences as they come to this plane fence now and a faultless lead by Desert Orchid lands two lengths in front of Roller Joint on the outside. It's Desert Orchid by three lengths to Roller Joint and Desert Orchid by a couple of lengths to Roller Joint on the outside as it comes to it now and once again a mighty leap at it. Three plane ones in front of the stands remaining in this silver buck steeplechase over three miles at one furlong. They straighten up for home now. The grey, he's three lengths in front Desert Orchid He's four lengths in front, increasing his advantage now as he comes towards the last fence. He draws to it now. Richard Dunwoody takes off and a great leap at it. And it's great to have him back. Desert Orchid, he's on the winning list again. As he strides up to the line to win his 28th win uh, of his career. It's Desert Orchid striding away. <laughs>